he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Good morning. It is good to see everybody here this morning. We are glad uh, that you have made the choice to worship with us this morning. I know we have several visitors with us this morning and we're grateful for your presence. Uh, we're glad that you have made the choice to worship with us. So I want to pose a question to get us started this morning. How would you measure God's love for us? How would you, if someone were to ask you, measure the depth of which God loves us? You know, every week we talk about God's love. We talk about it in Bible classes. We talk about it in our preaching, we sing about it. There's not a week that goes by that you and I don't talk about the love of God in some way. The verses that I read by way of our introduction this morning, and I'll invite you to go ahead and start turning to Ephesians chapter 3. Paul is challenging his audience. He's challenging them to understand the love of Christ and by way of implication, the love of God in their lives. Because he believes with everything in him that the key to success in them demonstrating their love for others is truly comprehending and understanding God's love for them. But how often do we just pause, and I mean thoughtfully, deeply, try to somehow understand and grasp God's love for us. I appreciate Tony leading us in that song we sang just a moment ago. How deep the Father's love for us. You know, the songs that we sing are intentional and are purposeful in how they are chosen and in what they are meant to do. We don't just sing random things. We sing songs that are based upon biblical truths for the purpose of connecting our minds intellectually with our hearts and our emotion so that we draw closer to God and maybe in some way encourage each other more and better understand God's message and His love and His purpose for us in our lives. And if we ever fail for our emotions to connect with our intellect, then we need to stop and take a step back and ask ourselves, how are we engaging in worship? Because you see, that's part of God's wisdom in the purpose of song. Is song stirs within us something that just words intellectually by themselves can't do. This morning, I want us to look at that song, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. I want us to consider the words. I want us to tie those words to Scripture and maybe in some small way we can better understand God's love for us in our lives. Ephesians chapter 3. As you look at the, the context of what Paul is doing, he's writing a letter to the church in Ephesus. And in chapter 2, he's focused really entirely upon the cross. How, how the cross is God's grace demonstrated to man and how everyone is equal at the foot of the cross. And the cross has the ability to make peace between God and man, but even beyond that, between fellow man, between the Jews and the Gentiles in the context here. And then as chapter 3 opens, he says the cross was really the answer to what had been considered the mystery of Scripture. And that mystery was nothing more that God's love was now open to all mankind. It went beyond the Jews. It opened to the Gentiles, which, by the way, makes it open to you and to me. And it's because of all of that that Paul drops to his knees 
to utter this prayer. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of His glory, He may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being. Paul wanted them to be strengthened, and that strength came directly from the power of the Spirit within them for the purpose that Christ could dwell in their hearts and that as Christ would dwell in their hearts, they would be rooted and grounded in love. I love that terminology. Rooted and grounded. You see, love is the soil in which everything in the Christian life is produced. If you were with us in our Bible class this morning here in the auditorium, we spent the entire time talking about love and how love is ultimately the greatest commandment of all. It's where you and I should spend the bulk of our energy and effort in all that we do. And if we ever have a choice to make, we always err on the side of love. And Paul knew that in order for them to truly live this out in their lives, that something had to happen. They had to be strengthened by this Spirit that allowed Christ to dwell in their hearts, that allowed them to be rooted and grounded so that they could somehow start to comprehend the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Why? So that they could be filled with the fullness of God. Paul uses these examples, the idea of breadth and length and height and depth. Not that God's love could ever truly be measured, it's really the only thing that our limited minds have the ability to understand when it comes to trying to measure something. And Paul says, I want you to the fullest way possible, however far you can measure, whether height or depth or length or breadth, to understand or grasp Christ's love. One of the harder concepts, I believe, in all of Scripture to understand is described in a word that the world has come to use known as the Trinity. I think many of you may know that word. It's interesting, that word actually isn't found in Scripture. The word in Scripture is Godhead. But they, they've come to mean the same thing over time. And it's hard, and I wouldn't begin to, to tell you that I could accurately describe for you in, in its fullest way possible what that means. But I'll try to, to make it maybe at least in a simple way so that we can understand it. The Godhead exists in three different persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. All three are distinct personalities, but yet they are one in purpose. And that purpose is all directed toward you and towards me and towards bringing us back into that right relationship with God. So even though they are distinct personalities, they're one in purpose and hence one God. So by way of extension, this love for Christ also is the love for God. Consider with me the first verse of the song. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure. That He should give His only Son. You think about the role of God the Father. His role in Scripture is one of commanding and directing and sending. That is His primary role as you look throughout Scripture. But then you think about the role of the Son. And His role, the Son of Christ, was one of going and obeying. How difficult must it have been for God the Father to direct, to send God the Son, or Jesus, His Son? And then Jesus, with His love, to go and to obey as He was sent. I know many of us in this room are parents. And it's hard to think, as a parent, of sending your child into harm's way for someone else. But not just someone else, maybe someone else that stands in direct opposition to who you are and to your values and to everything that you hold dear. In essence, that's what God did. He sent His Son to be a sacrifice for those that stood in direct opposition to everything about His nature. 
You see, he, he gave his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How do you view yourself? It's kind of a hard question sometimes, isn't it? If I had to pick a word that I would want to use to describe me, and you gave me a list of 100 words, if the word wretch was on there, I would think that's the last word I would probably want to choose. But I want you to look back, maybe just a page or two in your Bibles, to Ephesians chapter 2 with me. And I want you to notice how Paul describes the group of people that he is writing to here in Ephesus. And this same description would apply to you and to me. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in, what, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. You see, that was his audience prior to the cross. But notice two words that start verse 4. But God. You see, that changed everything. The definition that Paul uses here in Ephesians chapter 2 is not a pretty definition of their life prior to the cross. And see, you and I have to understand that this is us prior to the cross. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 would say that God shows His love toward us while we were still sinners. You see... How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. You see, His giving had purpose. It, it was thought out, it was planned out, and that purpose was to take that wretch, to take the thing that had no value, and through the sacrifice of His Son, turn it into something precious and valuable. I love the words of the song, a treasure. You see, you and I, as we sit here this morning, are considered treasure in the eyes of God. And that treasure was bought and paid for at an incredible price. How great the pain of searing loss. The Father turns His face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. As God commanded and directed and sent His Son, and Jesus obeyed and went, as He hung upon that cross and bore the sins of the world, the Father turned His face away. And at that instant, at that moment, for the first time as Jesus had lived on this earth, He was separated from the Father. Can you imagine how hard that was on God? We'll talk about Jesus in a moment and what that did to Him, but think about God the Father as He witnessed what was happening, how difficult that was, all for the sole purpose of the wounds which would mar the body of Christ, the irony in these words, that they would heal us, the wretch. How deep the Father's love for us. Let's go to Isaiah now, chapter 53. Isaiah lived and prophesied at a time in Israel's history where Israel had completely gone off into idolatry. And he was prophesying, trying to bring faith back to a faithless nation. And as he would prophesy, he would bring words of condemnation and warning. But in the midst of it, he brought words of hope. He brought words of encouragement of the coming Messiah. In one of the more famous passages in all of Scripture, that deals with Messianic prophecy, Isaiah chapter 53, we read words 
that describe the suffering that Jesus went through. And as we look specifically at Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 through 6, I want you to notice with me how many times personal pronouns are used to describe why Jesus did this. Isaiah chapter 53, beginning in verse 4. Surely He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed Him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon Him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with His wounds we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to His own way. And the Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of us all. Consider the words to the second verse. Behold the man upon a cross. What do you see when you look at the cross? When you stop in those moments, private moments, when you intimately look at the cross, maybe when we're gathered around the table, maybe at home in the week as you're looking at Scripture, what do you see when you look at the cross? Do you see the man? The Hebrews writer in Hebrews chapter 2 in verse 14 would say that he, Jesus, partook of flesh and blood. That means he became like us. He had skin and he had arteries and veins. And through those arteries and veins, blood would pump. And if he was cut, he would bleed. He had nerve endings and pain receptors. And if he was cut, he felt the sharpness of the pain of the cut. Do you see the man? On the cross, do you see his body covered in dry blood? Do you see the wounds from the scourging his back, nothing more than raw flesh? Do you see the cuts on his head from the crown of thorns that were pushed down on his scalp? Do you see the dried spit where he was spit upon? Do you see the spikes in his hands and in his feet? Do you see him struggle to breathe as he hangs there on that cross? Do you see him draw in his last breath and let it out? Do you see the crowd? Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. A few weeks ago, we considered on a Sunday morning the crowd at the cross. Do you see the crowd? Do you see those people that were throwing, hurling insults at him? I appreciate Brennan's thoughts as he directed our minds around the table this morning, as he challenged us to, to make it personal. And he had us look to our right and to our left. And as he did that, one of the thoughts I had in my mind is, no matter which way the people beside me turned, somebody was looking at me. And see, when I look at the crowd at the cross, as ashamed as I am to admit it, I have to see myself there. I'd like to think that I would have been stronger, that I somehow wouldn't have been a part of it. But the truth is, because of how... I was before the cross in the way that we read just moments ago in Ephesians chapter 2. In essence, I was in that crowd. And every time I sinned against Christ and against God prior to the cross and prior to His blood, in essence, I was the one hurling insults. But you see, it went farther than that. It's not just my insults. I've heard it said it was more than the nails that held Him to the cross. And this song describes it. You see, it was my sin. It wasn't just the man on the cross. It's not just the crowd at the cross. Do you see Jesus spiritually on the cross? As He bore the, the weight of the sin of the world bearing down on His shoulders at that moment, as we've already mentioned, separated from the Father. Not because of anything He had done, 
but because of the sins of those that had gone before, those that have come after, because of you and me and all those that will come after us, it was that sin that held him on that cross. It held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. There are several ironies that we find as we read about the cross. There's the irony of those that would tell him to come down from the cross and save himself because you see the irony is if he would have done that very thing, there would be no salvation for those at the cross. There would have been no opportunity for salvation for the one yelling that at him. And there would have been no opportunity for you and me. There's also an irony in the fact that as he would draw in that last breath and breathe it out and his spirit would depart from his body, it was through his last breath and his death that you and I have life. That we have the ability to live without fear controlling us. That we have the opportunity to look to a future and a hope beyond what we experience here. But in order for us to truly appreciate that, we have to look at the cross and we have to see the man and we have to see the crowd and we have to see our sin and we have to see that final breath to appreciate all that He gave for us on that cross. The final verse, verse 3. Let's turn back to the New Testament, to Galatians chapter 6. Paul is bringing to a close this letter to the church in Galatia that he's written. And he's going to describe some of the people that he has warned them about. Let's start reading together in verse 11. See with what large letters I'm writing to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. It's maybe hard sometimes for you and I to understand all the the hubbub, I guess, maybe for a lack of a better way to put it, about circumcision in the New Testament. But in a, in a Jewish culture, it was and still is incredibly important because it was a sign of that covenant relationship between God and His people, the Jews, at that time. And as the church was established early in that first century, there were some growing pains the church had to go through. And one of those growing pains had to do with the Jews and the Gentiles coming together. And unfortunately, at times, some of the Jews would go farther than God ever intended them to. And they would try to force things on the Gentile Christians that they didn't need to do. And circumcision was one of those things. And sometimes maybe the motivation was out of ignorance, but there were other times that that motivation was self-serving for the Jews. Notice what he says in verse number 13. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, But they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. They just wanted to have control. It was a pride thing for them. They were in positions of power and authority, and they wanted to somehow still feel like they had control over these Gentiles. Verse number 14. But far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the the Israel of God. Paul in essence says, circumcision doesn't mean anything. It's irrelevant now. Why? Because of the cross. And don't put confidence, don't boast in in how good of a Jew you might be and whether you've been circumcised or not. Paul says, I'm only going to boast in one thing, and that's the cross. And for people that boast in the cross, guess what? You get to enjoy peace and mercy, Paul says. 
I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. Let me ask you a question, a personal question. Why are you here? Every one of us is here for a reason. I believe it's because we love God. And we appreciate what Christ has done for us. And because of that, Paul would say in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14 that it's the love of Christ that controls us. It compels us. We recognize what the cross has done for us. And now every aspect of our life is motivated and controlled by that. But maybe let me take it another way. How do we view the rest of the world around us? How about the rest of the religious world? Is it possible sometimes, maybe without even realizing it, to start to boast in our own righteousness? To somehow think that we've got it figured out and other people don't, or somehow we're better and others aren't? Can I tell you that that's not much different than circumcision and uncircumcision? What, Peter, what Paul said was, we only need to boast in one thing, and that one thing is the cross. That's it. The only thing you and I should ever lift up is the cross. We can never talk about it too much. We can't spend too much time preaching on it, teaching on it. I hope that as you sit there every week, you think he's talking about the cross again. I hope you think that because I am. And I want to be. Everything in our lives has to be controlled by the cross. That's where we put our confidence. That's where we put our faith. That's where we put our hope. And it should control every aspect of our lives. Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer. You ever just stop and think, why? Why did God do this? You think about everything that God has put up with in the course of history. We've been studying the book of Deuteronomy on Wednesday nights in the, in the adult class. And you just look at all the Israelites put him through as a nation. But then we get a little more personal and I think about what I've put God through in my own life. Why? Why on earth should I gain anything because of the cross? And truthfully, I can't answer that. There's nothing that any of us have done of our own merit that somehow makes us worthy of the cross. Nothing. But because of God's grace and His love and His mercy, every one of us had the opportunity to gain the reward that the cross has to offer. And because of that, we can know with all of our heart that His wounds have paid my ransom. We talked about that word ransom a couple weeks ago, and maybe you remember. It was paying a price so that someone could suffer a lesser degree of punishment. That's the idea in general of it in the Old Testament. Isn't that what Jesus did? Isn't that what the cross is all about? It's paying a price so you and I don't have to suffer the consequences of what we deserve. Man, that's a powerful thought. And it's powerful to think about God's love at work in our lives this morning. Songs are powerful. They're meant to make us think of truth and logic, but connect it with emotion. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns His face away. As wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon the cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from His reward? 
cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart, his wounds have paid my ransom. How deep the Father's love for us. I hope you'll think about it this morning as we stand and sing. The number 57 in the spiral hymn. Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness shining. Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us. Set us free by the truth you now bring us. Shine on me. Shine on me. Shine. 